All right, we're going to get started. Since we only have an hour, I want to make sure we try to leave some time for questions, um, which are what Isabel was just handing out. We're going to do written questions to make things go a little smoother. Um, so I just wanted to give a little intro um, and some background, and then I'll introduce our panelists, and we'll get started. So environmental injustice encompasses a wide range of impacts, including climate change, including, including climate change that impact low income and communities of color harder and faster than other communities. Organizations like the ones we're going to hear from today have been working hard not only to address climate change as a whole, but to address the environmental, socioeconomic, and racial issues that these communities that are, hit, that are hardest hit have dealt with for decades. These groups help frontline communities address issues of inequality and injustice through work addressing uh, topics like air pollution, clean water, green jobs, and enhancing frontline community voices in the legislative process all over the United States. CCL volunteers have known for some time now that the environmental and climate justice communities and organizations are important allies in the fight against climate change. Many of our volunteers came to CCL from environmental justice backgrounds and are actively working to learn how CCL chapters can serve as allies to frontline communities in their own districts. Especially after the most recent election, it's more important than ever for us to understand the work that these organizations do and how they do it especially as the battle for a livable planet grows more dire every day and the need for a unified climate movement grows stronger amidst our polarized country. I and everyone here are extremely grateful to hear from such an impressive group of panelists in hopes that we can better understand the issues that they're prioritizing and tackling in our new political landscape, as well as learning how we can work together in more respectful and impactful ways. So our panel, they're each going to give us about an eight to ten minute talk um, about their work, and I'm going to ask a few prepared questions that I have, and then hopefully we'll have some time to ask, get to the questions that you guys can write. Um, and now, oh, and then at the end, we, I just wanted to let everybody know if you're interested in this topic, we do have an action team that works on environmental and climate justice. They speak monthly, uh, and you can join on CCL community, but a few of the members will be at the back of the room after this as well. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this and want to get more involved, they're the people to talk to. Uh, so we're first going to hear from Corrine Taylor. She is the Federal Policy Associate for WE Act for Environmental Justice in the Washington, D.C. office. In this role, she helps advance the federal agenda of WE Act and the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change to ensure that the needs of environmental justice communities are taken into consideration in legislation and rulemaking. She's a graduate of the Florida A&M University College of Law and a member of the American Bar Association Section on Environment, Energy, and Resources. Green is a strong advocate for civil rights, understanding that environmental justice is a direct extension of the civil rights movement. We're also going to hear from Marcus Franklin. He is a program specialist with NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program, where he focuses on energy, energy justice and community climate resilience initiatives. He holds a Bachelor of Science in the Science of Natural and Environmental Systems and a Master of Public Administration from Cornell University, where he studied ecosystem biology, environmental policy, and nonprofit management. Marcus is also an advisory board member of the nonprofit Climate Changers based out of Trumansburg, New York. And finally, we have Michelle Romero, who I'm sure many of you saw on Saturday night. Uh, we were, I was actually in this room, so it's very fitting. Uh, she is the Deputy Director for Green for All. And Michelle has nearly a decade of organizing and advocacy experience fighting for progressive issues, ranging from immigrant rights and economic justice to higher education, redistricting, and voting rights. Michelle joined Green for All in early 2016 to bring her interdisciplinary and multi-ethnic organizing experience to the fight for climate justice. In her role as Deputy Director of Green for All, she leads the team to implement a bold climate agenda that seeks to create an inclusive green economy for all, starting with those hit first and worst by pollution and climate change. Immediately prior to joining Green for All, Michelle worked in the Issues Management and Policy Analysis Unit for President of the University of California System, Janet Napolitano. She also spent five years at the Greenling Institute leading state strategy to ensure communities of color have a voice in the major decisions that affect their lives and received legislative and congressional recognition for her work to engage an unprecedented number of low-income people and people of color in California's citizen redistricting process. 
Michelle has published research on barriers to voting, advised state and local government agencies about effective practices for engaging communities of color in decision-making processes, wrote and lobbied for legislation, and helped catalyze a shift in the election policy community to design programs that are user-centered. And she holds a BA from the University of California at Santa Cruz. So let's give them a round of applause and then... Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Kareen Taylor. I'm the Federal Policy Associate for WE ACT for Environmental Justice. WE ACT is an environmental justice organization that's based in Harlem, New York. We've been there for over 28 years. And just um, my goal today is just to kind of give you a quick run through of what we've been working on and the kinds of communities that we represent. So I'm going to show a quick video because that's always a quick way to do that. In these areas, many environmental issues impact and affect all of our daily lives. Why is it that you know so many children have to go away in the ambulance? I start getting ready to cry, thinking of what's going to happen, and I'm, it scares me. Communities of color tend to be disproportionately affected. People of low income and people of color, you know, don't have clean air, clean water, access to fresh goods. We need to live in a space that will not kill us. Environmental justice means to me the person has an understanding of their environment and the ability to have a say of how that environment influences them and their family. There shouldn't be any lead in the water. Our children are slower. You're poisoning them. Waste treatment facilities, bus stations, there's just a lot here that you wouldn't see, you know, in the West Village. I raised my two kids in this. Three of my grandchildren were born living in this. The justice is correcting the issue. Why is this happening to my daughter? Why is this happening to my colleagues? Why is this happening to my cousin? You know, I want to do something about it. Never in my wildest dreams would I believe anything would have gotten done. With we act behind me, I was able to get out there, voice what I needed to voice, get things done. We act as a place to defend justice. Without them, I would have given up. I'm just happy to be a member of WE ACT. <laughs> so that's a great example of just our goal as an organization. We want to empower the community in Northern Manhattan to meaningfully engage around the policies that impact their health. Another video that we have. Um, so about WE Act, so for about 30 years, since 1988, we've been working to build healthy communities around a number of issues in Northern Manhattan, including uh, mobilizing people of color and low-income communities, climate and environmental justice, planning and practices, and uh, my work is, uh, focuses a lot more around this federal advocacy. But in New York, our members and our um, staff do focus on local and state um, policy and planning. So we have a number of things that we focus on, but I think what a lot of smaller environmental justice organizations have had to do, because we are always stretched for capacity, we're always small staff, we're always, we have a very tight budget, we have to be a little bit more targeted in our focus. So um, this screen used to be like 15 things that we focus on, now it's five. Uh, clean air, climate justice, healthy homes, sustainable and equitable land use, and good jobs. And all of these issues are pertinent, and I'm sure, in a lot of different communities, but especially in Harlem, um, we have really high asthma rates. One out of, uh, one out of 11 um, uh, children have asthma in our community. So that's something that we really want to focus on. Um, in terms of good jobs 
especially with the clean energy uh, revolution where we're seeing solar and wind happening, happening at larger rates, we want to make sure that our community has the access to the training necessary to participate in those types of um, employment opportunities as well. Um, and our Healthy Homes campaign is extremely important because as much as we think about the pollutants that are outside, there are so many more indoor pollutants that have a really high impact on people, especially for those who are um, very susceptible to respiratory issues, including um, children and um, elderly people. So we really focus a lot on these five, is five issues. Another thing that we do out of my office is we convene the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change. And this is a coalition of 42 organizations in 19 states. And we came together in 2009 when cap and trade was a really big discussion on the Hill. Um, there were a number of uh, bills that were being passed and we wanted to make sure that environmental justice communities had a say and were receiving information and also were becoming knowledgeable so that they could have um, a place at the table to discuss this issue. Most recently, um, coming out of uh, President Obama's um, climate action plan, we focused a lot on the Clean Power Plan as a tool that we could use to make sure that environmental justice was included in that plan. We, a lot, there's a lot of debate within the EJ community about whether the Clean Power Plan was the greatest rule for us. And in many cases, um, we saw that there were a lot of issues in it, but we still saw that as an opportunity to discuss and make sure that environmental justice was something that was included or at least thought of in the development of the state implementation plans around the Clean Power Plan. But now, uh, with the change of administration, we know that that may not be something that we can even um, depend on in terms of engaging that way. So we're still using um, our membership base to discuss um, climate change, climate justice, and uh, looking at environmental justice analysis in, in the use of other rules. So um, in preparing for this discussion, I thought it would be important just to uh, just quickly provide the HEMES principles of democratic organizing. Um, I think any time uh, we're moving and working with communities of color, with um, indigenous communities, with low-income communities, with any community, it's really important that we kind of know how to interact with them. And somehow, all of my numbers <laughs> are one. But they're, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I guess that means they're all number one. They're all important. But um, <laughs> most importantly, um, be inclusive. Uh, emphasize on bottom-up organizing, letting people speak for themselves, working together in solidarity, and build just relationships and commitment to self-transformation. So the theme here is letting that community identify, um, articulate, and be a part of the process in determining the policies that they will then be the most impacted of. I think sometimes organizations that might be better funded or might um, live in the green space have the habit of kind of parachuting in and saying, this is what we think we want to do for you. Instead of asking, how can we work together? What are the issues that are impacting you? And um, how can we make sure that it's not just a project, but a, a longstanding um, uh, av piece of advocacy or work that's going to continue? And empowering that community to continue to do the work after that campaign is over or after that legislation has been passed. Um, some of the focus that we've had, especially around the Clean Power Plan and still in some of the resources that we've created, is really articulating what meaningful engagement is with um, an environmental justice community. And some folks think, well, I had a public hearing on June 7th. Isn't that enough? No. That's very low in terms of the level of engagement. I think, um, as I just discussed, it's a process. It's identifying um, and scoping the, the stakeholders that live here, the groups that are already active. There might be some groups that may not do environmental issues, but they still do social justice work. They still have um, an eye to what the community is doing, and they still have leaders that are present there. So there's, there's a process in terms of identifying and articulating and having a conversation, and maybe doing more listening than talking. And I think with any, um, with any community organization, with any kind of stakeholder um, relationship, listening might be the most important skill. Because we have a lot more in common than I think the large society wants us to believe. I think there's always the, um, the, quick, the quick idea of kind of dividing us when in fact we have more in common. Everybody wants to drink clean water. Everybody wants clean air. Everyone wants to have access to really great parks. But that 
that kind of want and need will look different depending on the community that you're interacting with. And I think, again, in, when determining how to meaningfully engage, listening and understanding your community is the first step and the most important step in doing anything uh, productively. Um, I wanted to keep it short, but these are just some re uh, resources that we have uh, created and will be releasing shortly. Um, the one on that was from April was what we did around the Clean Power Plan. We wanted to make sure that equity and justice uh, was a part of the, um, all the state Clean Power Plans. But again, that kind of blew up on, in November. And so we're, we're making sure that equity and justice still is uh, present in any type of policy making or legislation. Um, we're going to be releasing our Cleaner Air and Cleaner Communities um, Environmental Justice Toolkit. And that will look at the state implementation plan of the clean air rule, which we think is still going to be a thing. Um, no, but that is a, a really great opportunity to engage with environmental justice, uh, justice communities and stakeholders to discuss um, their state implementation plans. We talk about an, an environmental justice analysis, which is an important way of looking at a community and the direct impacts of pollution that they're already experiencing in, term, in terms of developing uh, these state impl implementation plans. And uh, next week, and and if you follow up with me, I can give you more information about this. One of our partners, um, Jill Magleman from Got Green in uh, Washington, will be hosting a webinar just to discuss some of the, um, the, the failed I-732 campaign and climate policy and how grassroots initiatives are working in the Seattle area. And through the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, that's our goal to kind of um, heighten awareness about our partners. So we just had a discussion with Kentuckians for the Commonwealth who do really great work in Kentucky. Um, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization that does really great work in Chicago. So, um, you know, we we're thought of as a better funded environmental justice organization sometimes, and but we're a little bit more established. So we're using, I guess, some of our street cred and some of um, the um, support that we've received to help other organizations continue to do their work. So it's been a pleasure, you know, to be here today. I look forward to the other panelists and also to your questions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's just want to say that it's a pleasure to be here uh, to be speaking with you all this afternoon. Again, my name is Marcus Franklin, and I'm a program specialist with the NAACP's Environments and Climate Justice Program. Um, just to start off, to give you a little bit of sense of what that large umbrella is to us, we have three main uh, core objectives in our program. Reducing harmful emissions, uh, particularly greenhouse gases, I think that's fairly common from a lot of green organizations and even environmental justice organizations. Advancing clean energy and renewable energy wherever possible um, with the goal of providing renewable portfolio standards of 25% by the year 2025. Um, so pretty clean goal. And where a lot of my work is focused is on our third goal, or our third objective, and that's fostering and building community resilience um, in the face of climate change. Um, in that work, we focus on very much the standard definitions, or at least in my role. Um, I work in the office behind the desk. I'm an advocate, but also very much a knowledge-based person. Um, so we focus on distributive injustices, uh, so where are the costs and burdens falling? Um, procedural injustice, uh, who is at the table, what do those tables look like, and how do we actually advocate for our members to get on those tables and to work with other organizations with that? Um, and just one that I think goes a little bit under the carpet or swept under and kind of ignored is recognition injustice or cultural injustice and being able to recognize when solutions aren't appropriate for particular vulnerable populations and uh, marginalized populations. Um, in terms of the landscape of our work, uh, at least from my perspective, it's becoming pretty favorable. The NAACP is very much uh, interconnected and integrated in the way that we view a lot of issues. Uh, we are one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the nation, and we hold that history proud in everything that we do. Uh, everything is people-centered. And now that we see kind of a coming together of all these different organizations and different issues and different sectors and fields, that's something that we feel strongly about integrating into our process and continuing with. 
Um, so in terms of bringing together environmental justice organizations with uh, labor justice organizations and economic development and bringing those together is where our process kind of comes from. Um, in terms of community resilience, we very much look at the context of the community. Uh, vulnerable communities and frontline communities are different across the nation and a lot of our work in community visioning is about sitting down and listening, kind of like Corinne said earlier, um, really understanding what that context is and what those issues are for each member of a community. Um, that includes racial groups, gender groups, uh, nationalities, ethnicities, kind of the entire gamut. We really much look at an intersectional approach at things and at times I think that that does get a little bit dicey with others and how, you know, forthcoming we are with that. Um, yeah, and so in doing that, we really focus on building a shared sense moving forward with a lot of our issues, and, like, and that's where we come from. Um, so in terms of the contextual base of our work uh, in recent years and recent uh, months, we've been doing a lot of trainings concerning sea level rise, uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, Florida, California, Mississippi. We've been doing a lot with Urban Heat Islands recently, uh, working in collaborations to actually bring that knowledge to STEM classrooms, so incorporating environmental justice goals into uh, STEM teacher guides. Um, and more recently, we've also been doing a lot of disaster preparedness trainings um, and really moving forward with teaching and providing technical assistance around community visioning processes. Um, that are inclusive. Um, one other project we've been focusing on is equity analysis of U.S. climate uh, carbon markets. Um, so what initiatives exist, where equity comes into play, what have other environmental justice organizations been dealing with and advocating for, and how can we actually create solutions within these market mechanisms that are fair for frontline communities. Uh, we've spoken to individuals in California, including the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. I believe that's right. APEN. Yeah. Right. And a few others, including organizations and alliances in Washington State and Oregon, to see exactly what those proposals look like, um, where money is going, how the policies and provisions are in place, and what communities are being targeted, and what communities exist in those places that we can move forward to. And a lot of what we do is getting our constituents and our membership base up to stuff and educated on it to go into those and actually converse and go and provide the POC perspective or at least a perspective of where they are. Um, yeah. And in terms of opportunities, um, I think the integrated solutions is something that is very much there and that we're moving forward with and that we're really excited about working with labor justice organizations um, and providing kind of where we can our own perspectives in that. Um, in terms of collaborations, again, that's where we are. We're part of a few um, climate justice groups and coalitions that really span the broad range of groups, including Big Greens, um, other environmental justice organizations, like I said, labor organizations and workforce development. Um, and those kinds of things. But I look forward to questions because I'm much better at that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, Will you forgive a naive question? Uh, of course. Give me an example of a solution that's culturally inappropriate <clears throat> in some situations. Yeah, um, so one that does come to mind are issues around relocation um, in communities. So after disasters, uh, Hurricane Katrina is a perfect example in terms of what happens to socially vulnerable communities, low income communities, and communities of color, even in these larger things that are seen as good progressive economic development solutions. Uh, they are not given the correct kind of funding to come back in. Uh, what happens to their communities, very easily gentrified, and that's kind of um, part of it. You also see with a lot of indigenous communities when they're moved out of their areas, they're split up. And that's part of providing culturally appropriate and, you know, at least some sort of recognition into cultures when coming up with solutions. I guess I'll call it there. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to put my notes here. Oh, that, I just didn't want to turn off the computer. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you feeling? Good. It's great to see everybody gathered together to really focus on solutions at a time like this, when it can be really easy to just sort of sit in despair and sulk in the things that aren't working. So I'm really excited to see you today and to be here. Again, my name is Michelle Romero. I'm the Deputy Director at Green for All. Green for All is exactly what it sounds like, an organization that is about bringing green for all, not for some, or not only for some. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why I do this work. So in my bio, you know, there wasn't a lot of history on environmental issues. And there's a reason for that. The environmental community traditionally hasn't spoken to communities like mine. Um, things like polar bears and the Arctic feel very abstract and not at all relevant to the issues that are appearing in my community. So I worked on things like immigrant rights, I worked on things like democracy issues in California, um, and it took me a while to come to the issue of environmental justice or climate justice. But I remember, even as I was working on some of these other progressive causes, sitting at home and watching the news when a Chevron oil refinery had exploded, and they were calling for residents in Richmond, California, a predominantly low-income African-American and immigrant community in the Bay Area. They were calling for residents to shelter in place. And the, the anchor people on, on TV were actually saying, if you can find towels or blankets to shove into the cracks of your doors, do that, because the air right outside your wall is not safe to breathe. And I had a good friend of mine who was um, raised and grew up in Richmond. She was living there at the time. She's in D.C. now. And I remember calling her immediately when I saw this, and I said, Blanca, did you see the news? Are you inside? And she said, girl, it's fine. That happens. When, the, when that happens, the city sounds an alarm, and we all know we need to get inside. And if you were here on Saturday to watch the film Catching the Sun, it opened with that, with the city of Richmond sounding the alarm, hundreds of people going to the hospital with respiratory issues. And that's the kind of thing that's happening in low-income communities and black and brown communities all across this country. In the United States. We're not talking about a third world country even, we're talking about the United States. So that's why I do this work. That is bullshit. 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant. 80% of Latinos live in areas that don't meet the air quality standards from the EPA. 80%. Eight in every 10 Latinos you would know. It's a lot. So justice, um, as my brother and sister up here talked about today, is about putting an end to the injustice that we see. Justice is about building a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. A green economy that actually reaches and perhaps starts at the front lines of poverty and pollution. So I'm also here because I know the cost of carbon pollution is not free. Am I right? If you came to this conference, you want to put a price on pollution and make polluters pay, not families. I want that too. <laughs> I want that too. We're all paying the cost, that's right. Um, and again, as someone new to the, to the issue, I've learned that we're paying the price at the supermarket on produce because of drought's effect on agriculture. I've learned that we're paying the price in healthcare, increased healthcare costs, right? We're paying the price in a number of ways, and some are paying the greatest price in shortened lifespans, in depressed home values, in missed school and work days, because in one place, the air is so 
hard to breathe on days that the wind blows because of three power plants in the community and a fly ash dump, that they stay inside and don't go outside on those days. We're talking about in Oakland, where our director lives, communities that, they, that, in this case, are surrounded on all sides by freeways and highways and diesel trucks, that letting her four-year-old toddler boys outside to play is the equivalent of letting them puff on cigarettes all day long. It's the same health effect. So we do need to put a price on pollution. What we do after that is important, too, and how we even put a price is important too. We can invest in creating a world that we want, a world where our kids can run free in their own yards or even have a yard that grows green grass. In California, our director, Vien Trong, working with Asian Pacific Environmental Network, Green Lining Institute, and other equity and social justice groups, came together, we're talking about coalitions, yeah, came together and helped win the largest fund in U.S. history to invest in creating exactly that world that I'm talking about. It's making polluters pay and investing a significant portion of the proceeds directly into the most disadvantaged communities. What does that do? In the Central Valley, it's bringing solar panels to affordable housing units where one woman's bill, Maria Zavala, her, her bill went from $200 a month on average down to $1.50. As a single mom, it was a huge savings. And now she has that money to do whatever she wants, invest it in the local economy, you know, spend it in her local economy, save it for her kid's college, whatever she wants. Or maybe just decide she doesn't have to be stressed out about thinking whether she could pay that $200 bill or buy groceries for the week. Through this policy, it's bringing thousands of trees to communities like Oakland that I talked about, affected by traffic pollution. And it was able to have a, an organization called Planting Justice, which does job training, provides jobs to formerly incarcerated uh, men and women, actually plant those trees in their own community and get that grant to do that, to give back and to clean the air as they do it. It's doing things like allowing the community to purchase fuel cell buses to convert all of its public transit, which is a commitment now that the county can make because the resources are available. It's building community and individual wealth to create the world that we want. So there was a question um, in preparing for this panel about, you know, who are some of the most unlikely allies that we work with in this space. And interestingly enough, sometimes the most unlikely allies are green groups. Sometimes they are mainstream environmentalists. We have a, let's just say it, we have a segregated environmental movement, right? Where environmental justice, it's not surprising that we're people of color up here on this panel, okay? Environmental justice is code for people of color and the environmental movement is code for white folks. And it shouldn't be that way. We all really do want the same thing. It's just about how we get there and understanding the places from which we're starting to build those connections. So like you, like I said, I want a price on carbon. And I also want to invest in a future that's worth fighting for. I want to invest in a future that brings green for all. Thank you so much for having me, you guys, and thank you so much for your work. Okay, so I had a few questions that I had emailed them um, beforehand that I thought would be interesting for all of us to hear. Um, and I think I'm gonna, if we can, I'm gonna try to pass it down if that works, or we can get up, whatever. Um, so the first one I wanted to ask was where in this challenging moment right now for climate change and environmental justice work do you think are the opportunities for making the biggest forward strides together across organizations? And what do you think needs to happen uh, for organizations like ours or yours that we can make more of those happen, more of those connections? Stephanie, there's wireless mics right there. Oh, thank you.
Hello, hello. It was. Yeah. Thank you. Can I see the question just so yeah. I didn't miss it? Yeah. Because you had some good. Okay. I think one of the challenges, and I mentioned it before, um, especially in comparison to the larger green groups and to smaller community organizations and grassroots organizations, um, in terms of doing our work, is capacity. Um, a Green 2.0 released a study on just uh, the number of people of color that are in some of the main greens and then there's also a study in some uh, data about how funders are looking at environmental justice organizations and bigger green groups and I know right now coming out of the election everyone who kind of maybe had been splintered over a specific issue we're pretty much seeing everything through a pretty similar lens in terms of how we want to approach climate at justice, you know, looking at Paris, looking at um, a lot of the decisions going on, but that funding isn't being evenly distributed. And what happens, unfortunately, um, is a larger green group or a better, better funded organization will be able to come in and they have the resources to do the work, but of course they may not fully grasp being the environmental justice community or what their specific issues are. So they'll kind of re-grant those funds in a way, but they'll give them like a very small percentage of this larger pot that they've been given. And the only good thing that can come out of that is groups are getting money, but it's not enough to sustain the organization. It's not enough to allow people who have to decide between keeping their organization running and paying their mortgage, um, you know, the, the flexibility to do all the things that they want to do. And so uh, I would, I think a challenge that we keep talking about is how are we funding this work and how are we fairly funding this work and how are we making sure that environmental justice organizations and social justice groups are, um, are where they need to be financially to do the work because what happens is, we will request or um, submit for multiple grants and sometimes the grants take us away from the work that we really want to do or dictate to us how we should do it and that may not always be the right thing for our organization but again because we're you know we're cash strapped um, it's the only thing that we can do and I'll use this as an example like coming out of um, President Trump's um, executive order around the travel ban ACLU received millions of dollars within a very small period of time but what about those smaller groups that still were working with the ACLU to do the work on the grassroots level did they receive any funding was anything trickled down to them or were they even thought of at all and I think the same thing goes for environmental justice groups you know and and how we interact with big greens and feeling like they get this big pot of money to do work and then they ask us to help them and we're doing it for pennies. So I think that's a really big challenge. But the opportunities are there to address that. Can I see the question? Oh, yeah. sure, yeah. <laughs> this is the second one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and, and going off of that, our kind of, I won't hit the funding side, but I think there is kind of the otherness to that and it's bringing in environmental justice groups uh, for the name only and not to actually even do anything but provide the background and legitimacy for a lot of different things. Um, in my capacity at the NAACP, I see this a lot um, in energy issues when groups are getting together and going to public service commissions and legislatures uh, with different things. We have this set up, you know, we would like you to sign on it. It helps you. And, and that mentality just very one, it's stifling for our organizations and our people. Um, and our speak about my constituency, uh, particularly in some cases, they are just emerging into the space or their lens isn't necessarily from that initial place of cost savings or energy necessarily. It's about health usually. So they just aren't well equipped to come into these new perspectives because they don't see it as their problem. Um, so I think that there's definitely an opportunity to overcome that challenge by being more intentional in how you engage with us, um, creating a platform after the fact and not necessarily providing one just in place and inserting us in there and just putting our brand on it. Um, it helps, it's necessary, you know, politics is the way of life, but for any real movement to happen or any convergence between the environmental justice movement and the environmental movement, there needs to be more trust in terms of actual capacity in doing things, which kind of feeds into uh, the funding conversation as well. Yeah.
this one. Um, we, I'm trying to, it's complicated, it's complex. It's so basic to me, but trying to explain the political strategy. Um, we know the fastest way to tackle pollution is to tackle it where it lives. That just makes sense. You wouldn't actually go try and um, fight, like what else would you fight? Okay, I'm bad at analogies. I took a red eye flight, you guys. I'm, I'm burning out now. But we know that the, the fastest way to tackle climate change is going to be to tackle pollution where it lives, okay? And the fastest way to accelerate the clean energy economy is, to get, is going to be to invest in that acceleration. And the only way to sustain any change we, we make is going to be to build broad support. So one tangible thing um, I would offer is, even in the short time I've been working in this space, I have heard on numerous occasions on phone calls <laughs> related to this issue or other issues, when someone raises a question about equity or, well, how will this policy reach people at the front lines? And someone else so kindly responds, well, sure, something along these lines, you know, sure, that's important. It's just not our priority right now. I feel when people say that, like they're patting me on the head. They're there, little one. You just don't understand what we're doing. We're smarter. And in fact, I actually think we're trying to do the same thing, right? We're trying to save the planet and we're trying to save the people. It's a difference in the approach. And communication matters. And if anything from this last election has taught us, communication matters. And being able to master a message that'll move a movement is, when, is what's going to be the difference between winning and losing. And so far, a lot of our messaging is still about saving the planet, which is more abstract. Theoretically, that is, in fact, to save all of us people. But we need to talk about messaging and solutions that start with people, that are people-centered. Us as individuals, as humans, the way our nature is, we connect on an emotional level. I might completely disagree with someone who is a, you know, hard Trump supporter, who hates immigrants, who whatever, but I can relate to her as a mom. There will be things that we have in common. There is more that connects us than divides us. I really do believe that. But when it comes to how do we actually bridge the gap between where we're starting, um, I think it's important to just recognize that. And the people who you leave behind will know that you left them behind. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hey, I'm back. Um, one concern, and we talked in the slides I just mentioned, sustainable land use. Uh, and this is happening in a lot of cities. It's happening here in Washington, D.C., any major urban um, city, a lot of the times our communities have experienced a lot of, you know, um, blight, you know, we don't have a lot of green space, we don't, you know, there's a lot of pollution in the air, of course, but the, the communities aren't kept up, you know, the, the, sometimes the economic base isn't there to sustain it via taxes, et cetera. And what we're seeing um, is when we are petitioning the city or when we make the strides to clean up a community, to have a park. I, I know in New York we work to clean up the Hudson River. Um, the byproduct of our real advocacy work is then becoming attractive to developers who had never thought about our area at all. You know, um, there was just an article about renaming Harlem Soho for, um, you know, real estate development so that they can rename Harlem and make it more attractive to people who want to live there and take away, you know, nearly a decade worth, I'm sorry, a, a century worth of, um, of legacy and history around jazz and culture that exists in Harlem. And that's the fear. You know, we do all this work, we've worked this hard to advocate for our community, but then all of a sudden we can't live in our community because now it's too expensive because of the work that we just did to improve our community. So it's this double-edged, very circular thing that's happening in, in all over the country, in Baltimore, in, in Detroit, in Chicago, um, where I know I grew up outside of Chicago and the Cabrini Green, um, 
uh, the housing there, the public housing there was like a horrible area that no one wanted to live in. But now because folks from the suburb want to move back into the city and that, uh, that project has been destroyed, where are those people left to go? They're, they're pushed further out and away. And that's just a concern of a lot of our organizations is, yes, we want and we deserve to have clean air. We deserve to have parks in a walkable distance and we deserve to have grocery stores. But once we get these things, how do we advocate for fair and equitable housing? And then that becomes that issue. How do we make sure that rents are stabilized or um, a landlord doesn't uh, want to push out tenants who are rent controlled so that they can then take advantage of the, the, uh, the change in the market. And that's a very big challenge for not only um, our organizations, but our communities that we represent is making sure that they can stay where they've worked so hard to advocate for. So, so, so Wait. can you talk more about that, about what, how you're doing that? How that it's, uh, and <laughs> the unfortunate thing, especially looking at it through the lens of um, Harlem, is a lot of these decisions had already been made and a lot of that property had already been divvied up with Columbia University being in there and kind of moving further, further uptown. A lot of those decisions had already been made in the 90s when people kind of weren't paying attention to it. And so um, it's been it's been maybe a 25 year process of just changing this community for the good. Like I go to Harlem and I love the, you know, I, there's a really cool coffee shop now and the grocery store is really nice. I love all those things. But I also do notice that when I get off the train in 116th on the A or the C, the people don't always look like me as much as they did before. Each trip, it's a little significantly different. And I can't fault someone for who maybe have lived downtown who couldn't afford it because it was crazy expensive and now they have to move uptown. Like that's the economics of real estate, that's the economics of living in an urban area, a place that people want to live. But I think what we're trying to do is having more of the policy discussions with our city council, having this, you know, making sure that when Columbia builds something new that they're thinking about how that impacts the communities that are already there. Um, and, and the thing is, it's very spotty, like uh, some places, Midtown, or not Midtown, but like 110 in the Cathedral, in the cathedral Parkway area are really seeing a gentrification change. But then there's places near our offices and in the video, um, our uh, members were coming out of the building like around 140th to 154th that just aren't seeing it at all. They don't have any grocery store. The one grocery store that was con um, that was in the area was ran by a church, a, a, a Abyssinian Baptist church, and it's closing. And so that community have to go further up or further south to go to a grocery store. But what will replace that grocery store? Another condo that will then make the community that much more expensive. And it's hard. I, I don't know how we stop development. You know, um, a lot of this, un, un, unless people are paying attention early and often to some of these planning and zoning decisions that, are, that have been made 15, 10 years ago, and then the developers have access to this money, it's hard to stop capitalism like that. So it's, it's requesting the city, and New York is, is doing a really good attempt at addressing this through um, the development of mixed use, um, mixed economic, uh, mixed, um, mixed, what is it? Mixed, mixed income. But then there's this thing where some folks will be higher up in the apartment and then the lower income will be lower down and they won't have the same entrance. You know what I mean? So then there's this caste system within some of these apartments that are being developed, you know? So it's, it's really hard to push back against it, but that's why we're organizing. Um, and we, you know, when that, when that whole Soho thing started happening, and it's actually been something they've been trying to do since the 90s, renaming Harlem Soho. We, you know, we made sure that our members were present to, pro pro to protest, to advocate, to say no, to push back at that. And I think everyone who lives in Harlem, you know, white, black, Polish, black, um, the, the Jewish community, the Hispanic community there, they don't want that to change. They don't want that legacy to be lost. And I think when we see those kinds of things, when it's a purely capitalistic view, and then there's this cultural community view, we can push back and say, let's unite around preserving, you know, what we thought to be our home for a very long time. Thanks. Um, we only have a few more minutes, but I really wanted to get one, two other questions in, and I will take all your questions, I promise, and if you guys are okay with it, I can maybe combine those into an email and we can find a way to push that out to you guys. Um, I really wanted to ask what advice you have for CCL members. We, we are in 
pretty much every state. We're in a lot of districts, um, and I know a lot of us want to find ways to work with EJ groups on your issues. Um, so what advice would you have for CCL members that do want to do that and are seeking to build relationships? And then just where do you find hope and, and promising pathways, or what gives you hope uh, in this kind of challenging time? And you guys can sort of pick both or one or which one you want to answer. I'll start. What could you do? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it's the same thing you could do for any other group, right? You can volunteer with them, find your local environmental justice groups, um, volunteer with them, donate to them, um, start a conversation, get to know what are they interested in, start showing up at their events, ask the questions that you're asking here, you know, around like, well, how does this affect housing and gentrification? And whatever it is, just to start to deepen your understanding, get outside your comfort zone. That's my best advice. Get outside your, I think that's what we all just need to do is like get outside our comfort zone. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think that at the basis and core of that is it's just relationship building. It's, that's essentially what it is mm -hmm. in that level of understanding. And I think um, one way not to categorize it is that, you know, these are our issues. These are everyone's issues. Um, these are issues that uh, tons of groups go through. Um, Communities of color aren't the only ones that are relocated, um, aren't the only ones suffering from certain things. So I think that seeing it as that is one thing that creates the schism. So where I kind of see hope now is like we have these conceptions, we're starting to come together and think of things a little bit more holistically. Um, and I think that that's the way it really needs to be in holistically, not just in terms of all these processes are connected, but all people are connected and all communities matter. And it's hope and where you where you see hope and oh, okay. what advice you have for okay. members reaching out. To I think again, like November happened, and we were so sad. Like I saw people cry in my office. You know, like it was this real like what the hell just happened? You know, and we took that mourning period to about you know January twentieth. You know, and, and then everyone was like, okay, what are we doing? How are we getting together? And now we're like running and we've got this really great momentum. And I think what I'd like for you all to understand is, um, you know, it, it, it isn't, you know, it's not irony that we're people of color. And we're actually very fortunate to be in this space. And I think just know that we'd like to be in this audience too. We would like to be at these conferences. We would like to be at these meetings. We care about these issues. Um, the, the mothers of the environmental justice movement have been doing this work for decades and there are moms everywhere that care about this that are of all colors and of shades, but we just might not have the luxury of taking off from work to be here. Or we might want to be at that public hearing, but we can't take time off from work depending on when that hearing is, you know. Or we might be tired. There's so many, um, there's so many economic issues that impact our communities just differently than they do, you know, the majority of white communities, to be quite honest. And honestly, when we think about things like Black Lives Matter and those movements too, there's a lot of intersectionality there. And it's always a challenge to sometimes explain. It's hard to think about two things at once. It really, really is. Um, and the environment Though we, we've suffered with asthma. I have a brother who's suffered with asthma like his whole life. We've learned how to suffer through it and get used to it and just do our best. But then there's these other things that are, they seem so much more eminent and just so much like we got to focus on police brutality right now. We've got to focus on our housing issues right now. We've got to focus on all these different things. So I don't want you guys to ever for any second believe that we don't want to be in this space. But just know that the, the load and the, and the societal issues that we have to deal with are a little bit heavier and that our focus gets caught up in so many different places. So that's why we're fortunate to be the voice and to be the people that can at least speak for those who can't attend, who maybe have wanted to. Thank you. I think you're going to... All right, so we're at the end. I think it'd be good just to call it now, and I promise I will get your questions to them. And if you guys want to come up really quick, if you guys are willing to hang around for a bit, um, and then before the next session starts, we, we do need to vacate. But thank you guys for coming. <laughs>